I, I said this in a movie once, everyone knows the same truth, and our lives consist of how we choose to distort it. I am kind of amazed at what uh, Lawrence and Richard are doing because they are walking into some pretty prickly arenas and uh, they have a, no armor other than their own mental faculties. I think what these two men are doing out there promoting a scientific worldview is, is uh, something of great value because it is part of what humanity is all about, to be curious, to understand uh, what is the real world surrounding us. And this is what I love about science, is that it's just, it's knowledge, and knowledge is power, and it, you know, it empowers you, and it, and it frees you, because then you're not stuck. You're no, you're no longer stuck where you've been or where somebody else has been stuck. There are no scientific authorities. There are scientific experts. Richard knows a lot about zoology. I know a lot about physics. But there's no one whose views are not subject to question. Science just seeks the truth without prejudice, for better or worse. It, it doesn't say, should I find this out? It says, can I? And that's the point about beliefs. They don't change the facts. Facts, if you're rational, should change your beliefs. Throughout history, new discoveries have challenged existing beliefs. Religion is no exception. Religion is just like any other topic uh, and should not be sacrosanct at all. You should be able to discuss religion. Why not? I think religion should be open to discussion. I think everything should be. I think when you make things taboo, even when you feel like you're protecting it, it's, it's not for the greater good. We cannot close down a conversation uh, uh, about a set of beliefs that lead to actions which um, affect all of us. All that stuff I was taught about evolution, Big Bang Theory, all that is lies straight from the pit of hell. And this is the trouble with ethics and morality and the big questions and the fact that religions think they own that conversation. Quite the contrary, they kill that conversation. I think we follow people who have courage, you know, to think about things that we haven't thought about before. And uh, in these times where intolerance is kind of uh, championed, um, I'm pretty impressed that, uh, that someone is uh, taking on the, the quest. That's what I get from these guys, the permission to question everything. Richard, 10 years ago, I asked you the question in the, in the popular writing and speaking that you do, which is, what's more important in some sense, if you had a choice, which is to explain science or destroy religion? Oh, I think they go together, because I, I mean, destroy religion makes it sound negative. Yeah. To me, it's a positive thing. Science is wonderful. Science is beautiful. And uh, religion is not wonderful. It's not beautiful. It gets in the way. But there are all sorts of other things wrong with it, but I mostly care about truth, the beauty of truth, the poetry of reality, which is science, and the fact that religion as a scientific explanation, which it is a competing scientific explanation, it's so dull, it's so boring, it's so petty. It's wrong, too. And it's also wrong, <laughs> yes. Yeah, which I think is probably even more, more important, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think the same as you. I want people to understand how the universe really works. As an aside, ultimately, is this other incompatibility between science and religion that when, when, when empirical evidence tells you something, you have to accept it. When you give up that by saying, I can believe this myth and fairy tale, then it opens you up to lots of other things. And, and well, it, so it's not innocuous. Inevitably, when you have to deal with the real world, you inevitably make bad decisions. If we can get people to believe that, then it's easy to convince, or should be easy, to convince people that evolution is true because the evidence is so strong. Once you tell them the evidence for evolution, they say, oh, right, okay, so much for God.
Well, tonight, uh, Richard is in Sydney while I'm in Canberra. Uh, and he is uh, going to debate on TV on a television program called Q&A, the Archbishop of Sydney. And I'm here in Canberra debating the Muslim debate initiative. And we're both sort of l launching out against the forces of evil in different places. And that, that poetry was too compelling to resist. As far as I can see, this, is, this, this event has been advertised only in the Muslim community. Except for the few people I've told about it, no one will know about it except for the Muslim community, so it'll be an interesting audience. Oh, oh, look at that. Look over there. That's fascinating. That may be our audience right there, by the way. That could be it. Hi, how you doing? Nice to see you. Hi. Hi. I'm the, uh, oh, my friend. My friend oh, 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 okay. Hi. 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 Yeah, so the other person's going to talk. That's right. That's okay. right. But, I, but it's interesting. I looked online. I didn't see a single advertising for it. So. Oh, well, it'll be so interesting we'll see, to see. see how it goes. But I have a rule. If there's less than five people, we just go for coffee. Okay. Okay. Does that sound good? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit in the back now and, and read my Bible. Which is... <laughs> I just thought I'd pick it up for inspiration. Christopher always inspires me. Uh, Cardinal George Pell is the most senior Roman Catholic in Australia. He's the Archbishop of Sydney, and uh, I know rather little else about him, I'm afraid. And he's sometimes talked about as a possible candidate for Pope. I have always refused to debate religious fundamentalists. It's my understanding that a cardinal of the Roman Catholic Church is not a fundamentalist. If he is, I've made a mistake. gentlemen in this evening for this discussion. We know them already, but please let us introduce them properly and make them feel very welcome. Please help me welcome the author of The God Delusion, the evolutionary biologist. He is, of course, Richard Dawkins. Do you accept that humans evolved from apes? Yeah, probably. From Neanderthals, yes. Whether yeah. From Neanderthals? Probably. Why from Neanderthals? Well, why, who, else, who else would you suggest? <laughs> Neanderthals were our cousins. We're not descended from them. Are these extant cousins? What? Where will I find a Neanderthal today if they're my cousins? <laughs> they're not extant. They're extinct. Exactly. They're that's my point. <laughs> Your point is that because they're not, that because they're extant, they can't be our cousins. Uh, I really am not much fussed. <laughs> That's uh, very clear. Ignoring the limitations of science also leads to sloppy and arbitrary science. A good example is the field of quantum mechanics. The evidence of logic derives from the evidence of reality. Is it logical that I can be in two places at once? No, but if I'm an electron, I certainly can be. Because while you referred to quantum mechanics, I actually understand it. Most evolutionary biologists today don't believe that. Don't believe uh, what? They don't believe in uh, this crude fundamentalist version of random selection that you propose. I do not propose it, and um, I strongly deny that, that evolution is random selection. Uh, this idea that we should challenge our beliefs, I agree, in some areas. And this is the point I tried to touch upon the difference between science and religion. When, only when you appreciate the difference can you ascertain whether uh, different propositions apply or not. Anything about higher truth, about morality, for example, do you want me to challenge my belief every day that murder is wrong? 
Well, if any of you stopped believing in God, I would ask you, would you go out tomorrow and murder your neighbor? Well, some of you say yes. Good. Evolution is non-random selection. Oh, non so there's a, there's a purpose to it, is there? No. <laughs> could, could, could you explain what non-random means? Yes, of course I could, as my life's work. Um, <laughs> no idea should be above ridicule. Ridicule is a very important tool. And why should religion not be subject to ridicule if politics is subject to ridicule, if science, if sex, if everything else in, in the world is subject to ridicule as a way of illuminating reality, why shouldn't religion? It's part of being human to ask uh, why we exist. The question like why is not necessarily a question that deserves to be answered. There are all sorts of questions that people can ask, like what is the color of jealousy? That's a silly question. Exactly. Why is a silly question. <laughs> you can ask, what are the factors that led to something coming into existence? That's a sensible question. But what is the purpose of the universe is a silly question. It, it has no meaning. And so I hope that every student who ever goes to university at one point in their life has the opportunity to have something that is at the heart of their being, something so central to their being that if they lose it, they won't feel they're human anymore, to be proved wrong. Because that's the liberation that science provides. The realization that to assume the truth, to assume the answer before you ask the questions, leads you nowhere. We do have a scientific understanding of why, why we're here, and we therefore have to make up our own meaning to life. We have to stand up, look the world in the face, face up to the fact that we are not going to last forever. We have to make the most of the short time that we have on this planet. We have to make this planet as good as we possibly can and try to leave it a better place than we found it. And if we live in a world where certain things are not subject to question, we live in a world where thinking has stopped. And the second final result of tonight's Honda vote, with uh, more than 20,000 of you voting, we have a 76% saying no, religious belief does not make the world a better place. Please thank our special guests, Professor Richard Dawkins and Cardinal George Pell. I got thoroughly fed up with BBC type um, interviews where you have a chairman in the middle and you get an interesting conversation going on between two, is it, well, there might be five people around the table yeah. and, and A and B are having an interesting conversation and so the chairman then suddenly says, and what do you think about this C? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> totally breaking the flow, spoiling the conversation. In, all in the interest of balance and things like that. And it occurred to me, why on earth do we bother with chairmen? They're not necessary. Certainly my recent encounter with the Archbishop of Canterbury in the Sheldonian mm. Theatre in Oxford, that was completely ruined by the chairman, who was a philosopher and felt it was his role to clarify things. And of course that meant obscuring things. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a, I think conversations and conversations that aren't planned are fascinating for people to watch and listen to. Yes. I think it works.
So we should probably go. Up. Okay. So we'll, if it, to fill it up, I mean, we'll sometimes begin late. From my experiences, if it's yeah. really full, it begins a little bit late. It's to, usually to three or four minutes, late. yeah. I think it's appropriate to begin. Did any of you see Q&A? <laughs> I was amazed. Uh, Cardinal Pell, who was on the program, manifestly didn't understand evolution. <laughs> um, actually, he manifestly didn't understand anything, as far as I could really see. <laughs> Why don't you elaborate a little bit about that, that real problem? Because I think it's a fascinating issue of, of if speciation occurs, if species change, was there a first person? At first sight, it seems obvious that there has to have been a first person, and there has to have been a first rabbit and a first rhinoceros and things. After all, people are people, aren't they? And their ancestors were not people. If you go back sufficiently far, your ancestor was a fish. Mustn't there have been a time when, so to speak, the last Homo erectus parents gave birth to the first Homo sapiens baby? And the answer is no. There never was a first person. There never was a first rabbit or first rhinoceros because every organism ever born belonged to the same species as its parents. And yet because it was so gradual, because it was so slow, uh, not only was our 200 million greats grandparent a fish, but if you go back further still, they were worms and, and, uh, and so on. And one suggestion that's been made is that people really have difficulty grasping the idea that animals turn into other animals so imperceptibly that you can hardly, hardly notice it. It's not actually that paradoxical. It all happened very, very gradually. And you could think of parallels like the fact that you can't see the hour hand on your watch moving. Uh, at some point, we cease to think of ourselves as middle-aged, and we start to think of ourselves as old. <laughs> but nobody ever goes to bed middle-aged and wakes up and says, oh, no. We had a meeting at my institute where we were trying to get at the origin of life. And it's fascinating to learn how much closer we're getting. I don't know if you think we'll get, we'll get to the beginning in your lifetime or my lifetime. Well, it's an exciting thought, and, uh, and I'm pretty hopeful that, that we might. You'll never be able to prove it for certain, I suspect, but, but to come up with a plausible theory that, that, that people say, oh, of course, that's so elegant and so simple, um, either it's true or, or it blooming well ought to be true. I mean, that, it, it could... I think you've hit the key point. It's plausibility. It, it is amazing and fascinating to me, and worth celebrating that the laws of physics, as we now understand them, have given us a plausible story to answer questions. That's amazing, which is, how could something arise from nothing? How could a complex universe arise from a universe in which there was nothing? No particles, and maybe not even any space. And it's amazing to me in cosmology now that we are beginning to get back and realize that even in something as complex, the whole universe could plausibly be created. But that's all we ever claim. And yet, whenever we claim that, we were called strident. <laughs> yeah. Do you notice that? Yes, I do. Um, it came up in the, in the Q&A debate, and um, I tried to uh, very briefly expound Lawrence's thesis that you could get something from literally nothing. The audience just laughed. I mean, it, it was obviously to them absurd. How could you possibly get something from, 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 from nothing? It does violate common sense. But as I said earlier this evening, you can't go by common sense. If we could do things by common sense, we wouldn't need physicists. <laughs> I mean, well, common sense, of course, comes from what was necessary for our brains to survive in the Pleistocene of Africa. They, so they had to survive. They had to know how to catch a buffalo and how to find a waterhole and how to climb a tree when being 
pursued by a lion or something. So our brains were never shaped by natural selection to understand either quantum mechanics, the theory of the very small, or uh, relativity, the theory of the, of the very fast. And it's actually a, an astonishing compliment to the human brain that at least some humans are capable of understanding. <laughs> No, I, it is really remarkable that we've been able to get as far as we can. But you hit on the, another point. Our brains didn't, not only didn't evolve to understand those aspects of the universe that it couldn't experience directly, but another aspect of the universe that it can't experience directly is long time. Absolutely. And I think yeah. that's another reason yeah. why evolution is yes. such a hard concept, because we, we just see we have a slice of 100 years and or we less. Can do, we can do seconds, minutes, hours, days, years, centuries. Even millennia we have trouble with. I mean, you, ca you cannot grasp the immensity of time that is 100 million years. Exactly. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. People think that just because there's a lot we don't understand at the edge of science that everything we know is going to go out the window, and that's not true. Evolution happened. The Big Bang happened. If I take a ball and drop it, it's going to fall. There are lots of things we do know. For me, the only solution I can see is to try and educate people, because if you don't have an informed public, that's the greatest threat to democracy. So it's incumbent upon scientists to do a much better job. And then it's up to the public to make the decision. They can decide that they don't want to do anything about global warming but that they should at least be presented with the evidence and understand the facts. Ladies and gentlemen, the dynamic duo of science. It's such a privilege to be alive in the 21st century and to look out at the stars, to look down a microscope, to look at down an electron microscope, to look into a, a single cell and see the prodigious, stupefying complexity of a single cell and then realize that there are trillions of those cells in your body, all conspiring together to produce a working machine which can walk and, and run and eat and have sex and think what a privilege it is for each one of us to have in our heads an organ which is capable of constructing a model of the universe. It is sad that that model will die when our brain dies, but my goodness, what a privilege it is before we do die. saying have to be an attack on my god it doesn't have to be an attack but that's all you've done you've attacked my god no, for the last six him. minutes no 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 you have all i've said is you don't need him 
That's an attack. <laughs> We've changed our minds about the universe. We've learned that the universe is more remarkable than anything we ever thought before. And, 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 and in fact, changing your mind and in fact being wrong is wonderful. You, you should try it sometime. It's really amazing. <laughs> it, it means that it, it, it means that. <laughs> well, let me ask something. If there is no God, mm -hmm. okay, if there is no thing called God, if he is nothing, can't something come from him? <laughs> <laughs> this, this makes my day. Miley Cyrus has tweeted a picture of me, where the, where, along with the, my quote about stars, one where I say, uh, so forget Jesus, stars died so you could be born. And underneath she put the word beautiful. Boy, and she seems to have gotten a lot of hate mail for that. I actually think they don't understand this, too, because, you know, they think she's saying the quote is beautiful, but clearly what she's saying is that the picture of me is beautiful. I think we both agree that what people want to do is they want to believe, to take a line from the X-Files, uh, um, they, they want to believe in believing. And so most people who have faith, I think in our society, naturally pick and choose from the doctrine those things they find absolutely ridiculous and throw out. Yeah. And, you know, and the Pope would say that's not palatable. And I, I would tend to agree with the Pope. I think if you can't believe some of the stuff and you need to throw it out, just forget the whole thing. Yeah. That would be, that would be my view, and I suspect that, um, well, there are, what, 535 members of the U.S. Congress, and one has said that he doesn't believe in a supreme being. Uh, that's statistically not possible. Um, <laughs> I mean, a fair number of those members of Congress presumably have had some sort of education. <laughs> there, there, there have got to be a very substantial number of, of, of atheistic members of the United States Congress, probably more than a couple of hundred would be my, my guess, and yet they cannot admit it. Um, so in, in order to get elected, you have got to lie about your, about your beliefs. And I, I, think, I think that's right, and I think it's good to call them on it in one sense. I disagree with you slightly, maybe because I, I, I uh, spend a lot more time in this country. And I would say, um, if, if, if people don't hold the religion on their sleeve, that it's not relevant to them, then, then it's not relevant, then it's not in the public domain, and journalists needn't ask questions about it. But if they do hold the religion on their sleeve, then it becomes in the public domain, and it becomes appropriate for journalists to bring it up. So because then it's an action. They're saying, elect me because I'm a person of faith. But, but I'm, I'm really coming back to the, to the nub of the question, which is that even if... It, it, they, they don't take any action based upon it. Um, I mean, um, an extreme example, which, which I actually published in a, on a blog somewhere, was a, a hypothetical doctor who uh, doesn't believe in the, the sex theory of reproduction, believes in the stork theory of, <laughs> of, of reproduction. I, th I thought I was pushing to the limit. I assumed that everybody would agree with me, at least here, that you would not wish to consult such a doctor. Not a bit of it. I was kicked around the room. The doctor's private beliefs are his private beliefs. They're no business of yours. So long as he can take your appendix out, whatever he has to do, then it doesn't matter that he doesn't believe in sex. He believes in, in, in the stork well, theory. That, that's where we're disagreeing. Because well, I guess it, it, because but the stork theory is relevant to his career as a doctor. Well, I'd have make, to it, say make him an for, eye doctor, then. No, I mean, yeah, well, then I'd have to say for a politician, if, you know, there, I, think, I, think, I, I think there are rights to privacy. I don't, I mean, I think if someone believes it, uh, that it's okay for them to have sex with animals, I shouldn't ask that question as long as they don't make it a campaign platform. 
And, 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 and so I happen to think that there is some, some right to privacy in the sense that, that, that if you don't wear it on your sleeve, and these candidates do wear it on the sleeve, including, by the way, Obama, and I think once you bring that up, then it becomes, then it becomes fair game. Now, let, let's end with, because you pointed out that there's one member of Congress, and I didn't know there were that many, um, <laughs> who, who argues that he doesn't believe in a supreme being. Uh, I just wrote an article that, about of a study that's been done by a group of psychologists in, in, um, in Canada and the United States. It's just been published. That says, that asks what, who, what groups people distrust. And um, it turns out the group that is distrusted the most are atheists. Well, they're not quite the most. They're on par with rapists. <laughs> and I wonder if you could comment. Well, that, that, that seems to me to be an adequate explanation for why uh, so many members of the United States Congress are obviously lying about their, about their private beliefs. I mean, if you're on a par with rapists, um, <laughs> It, it, I mean, I, I, I suspect that, that we've already had it in this country quite a number of atheist presidents. I suspect. Um, it wouldn't surprise me in the least if Kennedy was an atheist. It wouldn't surprise me if Clinton was an atheist. It wouldn't surprise me if Obama's an atheist. Um, but you cannot admit it or you, you simply don't get elected. Um, I would like to start a campaign for what are they called lame duck um, uh, presidents and senators and people to say, Okay, I'm not, going, I'm not standing for election any, anymore. I'm an atheist. I've been an atheist all along. Um, Yes. Yes, that's right. Um, he said it's never been so hard, never been so challenged. Okay, we're, we're, we're heading out, eh? Yep, another let's building? go, yep. Oh, all right, we're set up. What do you know? It looks like a real place to interview. And you, and so these mics work. I don't have to. I don't have to wear one. No, that's right. Well, that's good. I'm already in three, two. Well, Lawrence Krauss, welcome to One Plus One. It's great to be here. Uh, Albert Einstein was once quoted as saying, "If you can't explain it to a six-year-old, you don't understand it yourself." Your latest book, A Universe from Nothing, deals with some fairly weighty topics. How would you explain it to a six-year-old that the universe <laughs> came from nothing? Oh, well, I see what you mean, but it's very unjust. Um, I mean, telling children they're going to hell is surely by any standards wicked. I mean, that's just evil. But um, I am not doing anything remotely comparable to that. What I'm doing is telling children, think for yourself. Look for the evidence. Um, I'm not saying this is the way it is, you better believe it or else. Well, I, I, you know, it's funny because six-year-olds are a lot less biased than, than, than adults often. And the neat thing is, I'd try and tell them that nothing is not exactly what they thought it was. It was a little bit different, that the laws of physics tell you that even empty space is much more interesting than you thought. Empty space is a boiling, bubbling brew of stuff that's popping in and out of existence every second. And what's more amazing is what we've learned, that if you take all, just a bit of space and get rid of all the particles and all the radiation and everything, that it still weighs something, and we don't understand why. Lawrence Krauss, thanks for joining us on One Plus One. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Excellent, my friend. Hey 
what a disgusting idea. I mean, the, the idea that the only way to forgive somebody is to have a scapegoat, to have your own son tortured and killed, because there's no other way to forgive. The, I mean, the, the, the idea that there can be no forgiveness without, without bloodshed, without um, punishment, is, a, is, an, is an ancient idea, and it's a horrible one. In the particular case of, of the, the doctrine of original sin, the original sin is supposed to have been committed by Adam, who, as we now know, never existed. So we now have the preposterous idea that Jesus was sacrificed. Um, the, the scapegoat was sacrificed for the sin of a non-existent forebear. That's the, that's the fellow who finally let me in. He was out having a phone call. Yes. Yeah. Hi, right, good. I'm glad there's actually there's someone here to actually do this. Agenda 26 to 8. Hop over there, Lawrence. There you go. It's good to see you again. It is 26 to 8 on 702. Lawrence Krauss is our guest. His latest book is called A Universe from Nothing. You say the universe continues to get weirder. Are there moments when we make breakthroughs and things suddenly make a fair bit more sense for you? Because you, some of the stuff you do really upsets some people. Well, yeah. And, and, and really inspires other people to back their own beliefs. Would you prefer that it was just an esoteric academic discussion? No, I think, no, it's not esoteric. These are wonderful things. Everyone should be talking about them. It's, it's some of the most beautiful ideas and discoveries that humans have ever made. And if it upsets people, how can learning about how the universe really works upset people? And it is a shame that it does. We, it, we, instead of being threatened or having our faith threatened by the discoveries of science, we should realize that, you know, if you, that we should force our beliefs to conform to the evidence of reality rather than the other way around. And we should take joy in the fact that we are actually here in this random moment able to even ask those questions and get close enough to the answers. We don't have the ultimate answers. I don't claim in the book that I, I have the ultimate answers. I talk about what's plausible and the fact that we're learning we're, we're getting closer and closer to these, to even potentially answering these ultimate questions, is something we should all celebrate. People shouldn't be threatened by science. Um, no, I think that's, that's fine. Thank you very much. Well, it's been nice talking to you. All right, bye-bye. <laughs> Lawrence Krauss, as always, a pleasure to speak with you. Same here, thanks. Throughout life, you remain united. May you continue to watch our worlds and keep us together inside through Christ our Lord. Amen. So these, this is the nicest thing I've seen in any library recently. No, they're not poop. Okay. Can I do that? <laughs> but there's poo. That, is that poo over there? <laughs> My, my hope for the future of atheism is that it will no longer be necessary. Um, we, don't, we don't call ourselves a Thorists and a Zeusists and, and a uh, Leprechaunists because it's not necessary. And my hope is that the day will come when it simply is taken for granted that everybody doesn't believe in Yahweh any more than they believe in Thor and Jupiter. I think there's some indication that the religious lobby is getting increasingly desperate and is increasing the venom and the vitriol uh, with which they fight back. And I think what we may be seeing is the beginning of the death throes. And when you see a, wo a wounded animal in its death throes, it tends to lash out. Like I've been 
society is supposed to be. It's not one that excludes religious people. It's one that is inclusive of all points of view. It's definitely exciting. It's, it's definitely exciting and it re-enthuses you to go out and, and do your thing and stick to your guns. We've made so many amazing friends and Fantastic people here. Oh, I've talked to all sorts of people. Sit down to someone, you get up a conversation without any trouble. They're the friendliest lot you'd ever be. Dawkins, who's here, was kind enough to write the afterword for that book, and he made a wonderful comparison, which was... That there's some similarity. Before Darwin, life was a miracle. You couldn't ask the question, where did the diversity of life come from? It was a miracle. It was designed. What Darwin showed were very simple laws of biology. Natural selection and genetic mutation, essentially, could produce all the diversity on life, of life, the complexity we now see, from very simple beginnings, with no miracle. Now, at the time he did it, did he prove it? No. But it was plausible. Now there's been 150 years of proof. Now we take it the next step. We, do we know how the first forms of life started? Absolutely not. But it's certainly plausible that, given everything we know about genetics, biochemistry, that chemistry by natural processes can turn into biology. Do we know that? No. But it's plausible, and that's worth celebrating, that you don't need miracles. And it's the same is true for the universe. We've, we've taken from biology to that fundamental question, which was the last bastion for many people of God. Why is there something rather than nothing? And said, you don't need them. If this is the case, and our universe just popped into existence, and space and time were created in our universe at the moment it came into existence, along with the laws of physics we measure, then there's an object, if you want to call it that, that is greater than our universe. We call it in physics now the multiverse, in which case there are many possible universes. From a philosophical perspective, people have a problem with the universe that had a beginning. That's why they invented God, because they want something eternal, with no cause, first cause, prime mover. You pick your philosophy or theology. The point I want to point out is that the multiverse now serves the role of the prime mover. From a philosophical perspective, it, could, it can be eternal. It can be eternal and certainly beyond our universe. But the thing I also want to point out, because I've debated with Christian apologists often, and they say, well, you invented the multiverse because you don't like God. Well, it's true I don't like God. <laughs> but the multiverse was proposed because the laws of physics are driving us to us. I don't even like the multiverse. But if nature tells me that's the case, and the laws of physics are accidental, i got to live with it. So, to conclude, I've told you today the universe can come from nothing. More importantly, I've told you that you are far more insignificant than you ever thought. <laughs> and that's what I want you to celebrate here today. But instead of taking, and people say science takes away spiritual fulfillment and wonder and awe and happiness, you should be happier because you're insignificant and the future is miserable because you're here today and you're endowed by evolution with a consciousness and an intelligence and you can ask these questions. So instead of being depressed and requiring meaning in the universe beyond your own existence, you create your own meaning and enjoy your brief moment in the sun. Thank you very much. But the problem is that most people, most of the time, are desperate to believe ridiculous and divisive ideas for, for patently emotional reasons. And, and while rarely explicit, what they're really worried about is death. And when we're arguing about teaching evolution in the schools, I would argue that we are really arguing about death. It seems to me the only reason why any religious person cares about evolution is because if their holy books are wrong about our origins, they are very likely wrong about our destiny after death. Ex-Muslims like me, in Europe and in North America, are growing in number. We give speeches, we publish articles and books, and we communicate with one another. Infidel was the epithet, an insult that was thrown at me over and over again by family and former Muslim friends. 
It is a label that I now wear with pride and joy. We're in a brand new age for religions. For millennia, religions did not have to worry about the, the flock acquiring lots of information about other religions or about their own religion. These religions evolved culturally in a world of easy to maintain ignorance. But the new transparency of information brought about by technology, by cell phones, by the internet, and all the rest, is the first really drastic change in the epistemological environment that religions have had to face in several millennia. Thanks for your attention. To many, he's more than an evolutionary biologist. He's a champion of science and reason. He's convinced many around the world that it's more than okay to come out as an atheist. Please welcome to the stage our final speaker of day two of the Global Atheist Convention, Richard Dawkins. I want to take back intelligent design. I want to take back other hijacked words. Just as the feminists have rallied around the phrase, take back the night, maybe we should take back intelligent design in the true sense of the word. Let's take back morality. Let's redesign our morality, rather than trying to read what's right and wrong in a 3,000-year-old book. Religion has hijacked morality for centuries. Let's take it back and intelligently design it. Let's intelligently design our lives rather than be dictated to by priests and mullahs. Let's intelligently design our future using the gift of foresight, something that never existed before brains, and for practical purposes that means human brains, evolved. The ability to design is one of the crowning glories of our species. Bridges, planes, buildings, all sorts of ingenious contraptions. The essence of design, in this true sense of the word, is deliberate foresight. Human designers can look into the future and see the possible mistakes, see the possible pitfalls, try things out in imagination. Above all, look into the future, which is something natural selection cannot do. This is one of the major misunderstandings of evolution. People are so used to the idea that natural selection produces apparently good design, that they think that natural selection must be capable of peering into the future, of taking steps to stop the species going extinct, for example. Never happens. It cannot happen. Nature cannot plan for the future. The human brain can. We can look at trends in the present and extrapolate into the future. We can foresee possible scenarios that might lead to our species going extinct and take steps to avoid it. Thank you very much.
I guess the, the best part of communicating is, is the excitement. Science turns us on. Science is fun. Science excites us. You can't communicate unless you're excited. But on the other hand, that's, I feel it's so fascinating for me that I want to tell people about it. Carl Sagan said, when you're in love, you want to tell the world. And Sagan said, I'm in love with science, and I have to tell the world. But we mustn't run away with the idea that science is just fun. The science is, is hard. Yeah. And so it's not fun in the sense that it's just sort of easy and, and, and you can laze around doing it. It, it, it is hard, it's hard work but it's worth it. something I didn't know, I don't know if you knew, that the Royal Society has a patron saint. St. Andrew's is a patron saint. St. Andrew? Yeah. I mean, why not Doubting Thomas? He'd, would, be the, he'd be the proper <laughs> patron saint of that, science. That'd be perfect. Yeah. Doubting yeah. Thomas, yeah. because that's what it's all about. For me, this is the legacy of modern civilization. This is what it's all about. And this is the legacy that's worth preserving and, and, and sharing more broadly. And it's under attack. Yes, I mean, I see the history of science, modern science, as being weaning off the wisdom of old books and onto the wisdom of observation and experiment. There's a lovely story about um, Galileo being visited by somebody, mm -hmm. and Galileo showed this person something through his telescope, mm -hmm. and it, it contradicted what, what he thought before, and eventually he said, Mr. Galileo, your demonstration is so convincing that were it not that Aristotle positively states the contrary, I would believe you. <laughs> it was like just like looking through a telescope. It's surprising in some sense that we're talked about as being arrogant for somehow saying we create our own importance, that, that, that our knowledge and our understanding and the way we live our lives is what makes our own importance. People don't seem to recognize that a universe that's created for us is a little more arrogant. <laughs> Incredibly arrogant, yes. <laughs> and for me, that's the most powerful and enlivening thing is the fact that the more unimportant, unimportant we become, we are, uh, yes. the, more, the more powerful is, is the importance of science for pointing out that the universe exists whether we like it or not. The it's a sort around. of cosmic humility, but it's the exact opposite of what we're often accused of. Science is responsible for the, for the justified humility of humanity, uh, exactly. which is a new thing. Richard, the first, the very, I remember vividly the very first time we had a discussion that we disagreed. I argued to you that I thought that, that if you were trying to convince people of your point, that, that you shouldn't, the first thing you shouldn't say is, you know, everything you believe is wrong and you're really stupid. <laughs> and, and, and it's better to try and sort of uh, go to where they are. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I, can, I myself have been convinced by somebody telling me everything you believe is rubbish. I mean, I was, as a student, I was very persuaded by the, that old French theologian, Teilhard de Chardin, mm -hmm. who wrote a book called The Phenomenon of Man, mm -hmm. which is pretentious gibberish. But it fooled me when I was a student. Mm -hmm. And then I read Peter Medawar's brilliant review of it, of the book, which is almost certainly the best negative <laughs> book review ever written. And I was completely swayed, turned around by that, even though you might think I'd have, you know, pushed back and said, wait a minute, I, I, you're, you're insulting my intelligence. I said, well, yes, maybe you are insulting my intelligence. I deserve to have my intelligence no, insulted. People get the, in fact, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of research that says pedagogically, the only way you can really get people to learn is by confronting their own misconceptions and using them. I, do, I use it in physics all the time. Mm. You know, kids learn stuff on 
they, you know, you write stuff on the blackboard, it goes in one ear and out the other, but if you confront a belief they have and, and show them immediately that they conceive for themselves it's crazy, then they remember it. Yes. Well, this weekend, the Reason Rally took over the National Mall here in Washington, D.C. Billed as the largest gathering of the secular movement in world history, National Mall Park Service estimated over 30,000 people were in attendance. And despite the rain, the participants waited for hours to see speakers like Lawrence Krauss, Richard Dawkins, Adam Savage. So we had to ask what the largest gathering in history of atheists, humanists, secularists, freethinkers, skeptics, what does it really mean? President of American Atheists, and I would like to welcome you all to this, the largest atheist gathering in world history. But I don't believe in God. I, uh, I have two proofs uh, for not believing God. First of all, God, if you're there, we're here in Washington, come down now. If you're there, this is a pretty good time. I'm sure Fox News would love it. Just come down, say hello. We are the people who believe in this life. We are the people who believe in morality. If you are doing something for reward or punishment, you do not have morality. Let's make it so they're as embarrassed to say something bad about atheists as they are to say something bad about Mormons. <laughs> Mormon. <laughs> Mormon. Thank you, God, for fixing the cataracts of Sam's mom. I didn't realize that it was so simple, but you've shown a great example of just how it can be done. You only need to pray in a particular spot to a particular version of a particular God. And if you pull that off without a hitch, he will fix one eye of one middle-class white bitch. They are ruled by fear. That's not my style, and it's not yours either. <laughs> Folks, it's certainly time that we all grew up. Instead of forging ahead into the 14th century, we should be embracing the 21st by writing fini to belief in the bigoted, capricious, cruel, deceitful, genocidal, homophobic, misogynistic, racist, vindictive, and violent bully. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Folks, Professor Richard Dawkins. What a magnificent, inspiring sight. I was expecting great things, even in fine weather. In the rain, look at this. This is the most incredible sight I can remember ever seeing. How is it necessary to have a rally for reason? How could anyone rally against reason. I am often accused of expressing contempt and despising religious people. I don't despise religious people, I despise what they stand for. There are too many people in this country who have been cowed into fear of coming out as atheists or secularists or agnostics. We are far more numerous than anybody realizes. What I want to suggest you do when you meet somebody who claims to be religious, ask them, do you really believe that when a priest blesses a wafer, it turns into the body of Christ? Are you seriously telling me you believe that? 
Don't fall for the convention that we're all too polite to talk about religion. Religion is not off the table. Religion is not off limits. Religion makes specific claims about the universe which need to be substantiated and need to be challenged and, if necessary, need to be ridiculed with contempt. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be addressing the Reason Rally. And when you look at the who's who list throughout history of people who were either declared atheists or who voiced publicly their opinion that religion was bullshit, you can feel a swell of pride as you stand out there on the mall today. Let's let everybody know that they can come out of the closet if they're afraid to, because we're here to support them and embrace them, because this is an amazing community of people who are non-believers. And I think it's wrong that the religious right and our various belief systems have gotten a monopoly on morality and patriotism. We are Americans, and we're moral and righteous Americans, and we don't need a God to prove it. Come on out and join us. I have concluded through careful empirical analysis and much thought that somebody is looking out for me, keeping track of what I think about things, forgiving me when I do less than I ought, giving me strength to shoot for more than I think I'm capable of. I believe they know everything that I do and think, and they still love me, and I've concluded after careful consideration that this person keeping score is me. Emmanuel Kant was asked, what is the Enlightenment? He said, it is apere saude, dare to know. The Age of Reason, then, was an age when humanity was born again, not from original sin, but from original ignorance and dependence on authority. Never again. Folks, you're in for a treat. The author of New York Times bestseller, A Universe from Nothing. Please welcome physicist, Dr. Lawrence Krauss. As was just pointed out, I, a few years ago, uh, my friend Richard Dawkins asked me to give a talk at a meeting uh, uh, called The Universe from Nothing, so I did. Today I want to talk about something that's equally plausible but much more tragic. How to get nothing from something. It's happened a number of times in human history. It happened during the medieval era when religious dogma erased the enlightenment of the Greeks measuring the circumference of the earth, all of that was forgotten. It happened in the Arabic world in the 11th century when what was then the center of culture and mathematics became an economic and intellectual backwater because of Islamic fundamentalism. And it can happen today. But the 21st century is placing challenges on us like we've never had. Global climate change, overpopulation, the energy crisis, the need finally to educate and stop the subjugation of women around the world. <laughs> Einstein said 60 some odd years ago after we exploded the first atomic weapon that everything has changed save the way we think. And unless we change the way we think, and unless we're willing to revere open questioning, discussion, and a public policy based on reality, we can take this wonderful world we have now in many ways and turn something into nothing. And we all have to make sure that doesn't happen. Thank you very much.
I, I do see a problem that you can't live a life based on uh, delusion. You can't hold out reality all the time and just exist in a, in a fake world. You've got to constantly not only be challenging your own beliefs, but be willing to say that you had been wrong and misinformed and for your whole life and, and change your views. Otherwise, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a mindless existence. And that's not to say they don't have the right to believe. I believe everyone has the right to believe anything. They have the right to believe anything. But I have the right to find that belief ridiculous. I, I, I've had people on Twitter say things like, everyone has the right to their own opinion, so just keep quiet about your atheism. Brilliant. There it is. There, you, summed it, you summed it up for me. Well done. Uh <laughs> I did a courtroom scene on a show, and I look at the judge, and right above his head it says, in God we trust. I mean, I should have, this should have hit me before being on The Good Wife, but I just can't believe it. I just can't believe that's above our, that, in 2012, that's in our court system. These notions aren't shared by everyone in America. In, with religion, the stories have been told over centuries, and science is always telling a new story. And I think that that's what's hard for people who hold religion as the truth um, to understand that science is something that's broader. It doesn't start 6,000 years ago. It starts four or five billion years ago. And that is a really, there's a lot more information in there in the book. If we had a book, <laughs> it'd be a lot thicker. And of course, we have seen backlash against uh, scientific uh, understanding of reality. We have seen it in many religions, not only in the United States. So I, I believe there's a, there's a great value in, in promoting this kind of work. People who like science are all drawn to for the same reason. It explains the physical world. What is this stuff? Is, is it the last word? On, on what reality is and what the physical world is. I don't know, but it's the, it's, it, if it's not the last word, it's at least the best word. In our increasingly complex scientific and technological civilization, many policy issues require scientific knowledge. How then can the public exercise democratic control if it doesn't understand science? I think it's very important to advance the pro-science view in the modern world. What could be bad about advancing uh, knowledge and enlightenment? Uh, it can only be a good thing. If you don't get that there is some objective place from which we can all start, which we call science, a place where we get rid of our biases and get back to what we can observe, if you don't think that's the best place to start these conversations from, then where do you start them from? You have to start from, well, my evidence shows that gay people are just like me and they love each other, or that women are smart. The magic book kills discussion. You know, I went to um, Israel for the first time the summer before last, but people always say, oh, you go to Israel, you're gonna be changed forever, like you're gonna feel so connected, and I just, I mean, I didn't feel that at all. I, I went, it just was so, when I saw the Western Wall especially, and that this much room is for the men and this much room is for the women and they said cover your shins and cover this up or people will throw rocks at you, you know? And it's just like, I just felt like Fuck you. I, all I felt, all I felt was Fuck you. I didn't feel connected to anything because it wasn't including me as an equal. It's the rules, it's the arbitrary rules. He gave you free will. Well then why is he sending me to hell for using it? He moves in mysterious ways. I mean, moves in mysterious ways. That is the philosophical equivalent of going, nah, running away. I don't, you know, it's, it's strange moves in mysterious ways. What's the difference between a random God and no God at all? That's what I'd say. I think people don't really believe the myths they invent. I've been to many funerals uh, in which um, the priest has spoken of an afterlife and even the people who are there are sobbing profusely. They don't really think they're going to meet their loved one in 
five years' time. If, on the other hand, you stood on the quayside and watched Queen Mary set off for New York, the people on the quayside are not crying because they know they're going to see those people again fairly soon. A funeral is fundamentally different, yet it should be the same. I think myths are like a drug. I think a lot of people would rather just take the myth pill that makes them feel like nice and cozy and warm and fuzzy and okay with everything, rather than having to look at the reality of what the world actually is, because it's so big. But then I think what's so great about the world being so big or the universe being so big is that it's so big, and that is so cool. You know, early Christians were called atheists by the Romans because they didn't believe in all the gods. <laughs> I love that. I mean, that's what atheism is, really. It's the belief in one less god than you. It, the, the whole forward movement of trying to do this thing, give people the opportunity to be educated to a point where they don't have to lean on stuff that's probably not there, is a worthy cause. You have to be able to offer someone alternatives to the way they view the world, or how can they learn something? I mean, you can't, you can't keep teaching someone something they already know. If you so, are so attached to your belief system that you stop listening out of fear of that being challenged, you know, or, or shaken, you're dead. Most scientists are not up for this game of taking on these things and having it become a forum. But uh, once you start to step up in front of doubters, who's, you know, it becomes this idea of really, can you change people's minds from this debate? Or are you just like taking rocks and bashing each other's brains out? <laughs>